here tonight to talk to you about something which is very, very close to my heart. Because at the moment, there's a huge sense of hopelessness, despair with all the conflict and all the bad news that we're, we're com we have coming at us from, from different angles. But I think there's an antidote to a lot of what's going on, and I'm calling that real leadership. So I'm, I'm here tonight to talk to you about what I see as real leadership. But I want to start with a little bit of a story about myself. Probably one of the most challenging days of my life was the 28th of February, 2016. It was the second day of the general election count here in Galway West, and I had put myself forward. Now, anybody who knows Irish elections knows that the counts can go on and on, and this was a mammoth one. So it went on for 14 counts, and I would banked everything on taking a seat in Galway West. I would banked my job, my career, and what I saw as my reputation. So there we were on the second day, on the 14th elimination. There were three seats left to be decided, and there were four of us left in the race. And I was sitting on the fifth seat. I had a reasonable uh, headwind in my favor. So we waited with bated breath until the final count came along, and lo and behold, there was a huge transfer between two party colleagues, and my colleague leapfrogged me, and I was left sitting on the sixth seat in a five-seat constituency. And I felt like a complete loser. I felt I'd failed. I felt I was useless. So I looked around, and I thought, this is a moment in my life, I have a choice here. I could just skulk off and go and lick my wounds and leave quietly, or I could show my true character, and I could go chin up and deal with this as it came. Half of my team had left in disgust, and the other half were really despondent and felt really bad for me. So I gave my wife a hug, and I walked across, and I shook hands with the three newly elected TDs in Galway West, and I congratulated them sincerely. And they commiserated with me, and some of them said things like, ah, sure, better luck next time. And I thought, yeah, you probably don't mean that, but it's, it's nice, it's nice anyway. And then there's this whole kerfuffle of media that you have to do. So I had interview after interview after interview, and I thanked everybody who'd supported me in any way, and I tried to leave the stage graciously. So we were driving home in the car that evening, and I was completely deflated, and I was exhausted from the, the whole campaign, etc. But I was proud of one thing. I was proud of standing up and taking it on the chin and showing some re resilience. And that's what that story is all about for me, and it's a moment in my life where I feel I showed I had resilience. And resilience, for me, is the first cornerstone of what I call real leadership. So res real leadership for me has four elements. It's about being resilient, it's about being empowering, it's about being authentic, and it's about leadership. So I showed my resilience on that day, and I think that was important. But real leadership, I think, is very, very important at the moment. So we've, we're looking at a climate crisis, and there seems to be no hope, or people aren't engaged as they should be. We're looking at democratic systems which are crumbling across the globe. We're looking at young people who feel there's no sense of hope in the future. And we do need to change the dynamic, and we need to change the picture. So real leadership for me is the tool to do that. So who do I see as real leaders? Can I give you a couple of examples? Well, one person who stands out for me, of course, would be Nelson Mandela, a man who spent 27 years in Robben Island prison, but never lost sight of the goal of creating a South Africa free of apartheid. Somebody else who springs to mind for me as well is Vicky Phelan, who was the um, smear test campaigner who fought so hard for her own rights but also for the rights of all those other women who were involved in that. But she also inspired a whole generation of people to stand up for their rights. And somebody else who springs to mind for me is a very small lady called Rosa Parks, who in Alabama, during the, the, um, 
the campaign for civil rights in the United States, decided to sit down on a seat in a bus that was allocated for a white male. So for me, Nelson Mandela epitomizes resilience. Vicky Phelan epitomizes empowering people. And Rosa Parks, for me, epitomizes authenticity, being who you are. So Rosa Parks was very active in the civil rights campaign in the States, but while that was happening globally, there were also people active in other civil rights movements. I think of 1968 in, in Paris and the student riots in France. Of course, we have our own scenario in Ireland where we had the civil rights movement in the North. But you may not know that we also had a civil rights movement closer to home in Connemara. They were called Glushacht, Sheevelt, Carte Sheevelt and the Gaeltachta. And they marched from Barna to Karna to campaign for the rights of Irish speakers and people living in the Gaeltacht areas to be able to live and work through their own language in their own communities. So they were instrumental in the campaign that set up Radio on the Gaeltacht, which is the Irish language radio station, and then Udaras on the Gaeltacht followed. A number of years later, they also decided that it was time we had a TV service. So they started a campaign for what they called Telefish on the Gaeltacht at the time. But of course, who were these? There were only a crowd of cultures from down in the Gaeltacht area of Connemara, and they were being told by the engineers it was absolutely impossible. Sure, you couldn't do that. You couldn't have a TV station based in Connemara. But these guys had resilience, and they weren't going to take no for an answer. So what they did was they set up a very rudimentary satellite in Connemara. So this was on a hill in Kilhuron called Croke Mordon. And they also set up a ramshackle studio in the community hall in Rosmuk. So this was October 1987. And for that weekend, they broadcast through South Connemara. And they proved that it could be done. So they defied the authorities, they showed their resilience, and they proved that it could be done. At the time then, there was quite a well-known politician who you might have heard of called Michael D. Higgins. And he'd heard of this civil rights movement in the Gaeltacht area, and he agreed with a lot of what they wanted to do. So he took up the baton, and when he became Minister for Arts, Culture and the Gaeltacht, he was instrumental in the setting up of Telefish Nogelia. But again, the powers that be, mainly in Dublin, I'd have to say, were telling Michael D, well, if you're going to make a TV station that's a national station, it has to be based in Dublin. And Michael D said, no, we're not going to do that. We need this TV station to have a Sul Ella, to have a different perspective on life. And it's going to be based in the Connemara Gaeltacht. And it is. And around that time as well, Michael D had incredible foresight because what he did was he re-established Bord Scun on the Heron, the film board. He also, through the Ross and other mechanisms, supported TV companies like the Roger Corman Studio in Ballinahown, companies like Telegale in Spiddle, Nemeton in Waterford, Ross Naroon, etc., and a whole host of other companies. So what he did was he empowered individuals to work in the media industry. He empowered companies and he empowered communities. And empowerment is the second leg of what I call real leadership. Are we still here? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. As a former thespian, anyway, I should be able to project my voice to the back of the theater. It shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. So empowerment is really, really powerful. And another recent example of empowerment that springs to my mind and of real leadership comes from my own boss, a guy called Alan Esselmont, who's the director general of TG Cahar. Because he argued that, really, if we wanted the Irish language and Irish language media to be taken seriously, we had to have status for the language. And what he argued was that to get status for the language, we needed it to be recognized on an international level. And the best way to do that would be to make feature films in Irish that will be shown at film festivals around the world, etc. So we set up a scheme and we started to do that. And lo and behold, he said to us at the beginning, and I remember him saying to us in, in a meeting in the boardroom, that the benchmark of success for this project would be if an Irish language film were ever to be nominated for an Oscar. 
He did. He said those words a number of years ago. And lo and behold, last year, on Colleen Kuhn, made it to the Oscars. Because people were empowered to do it. And Connie Kuhn is an amazing story, um, an amazing production. And what, I really, what really struck home to me about Colleen Kuhn was the way it was produced and the couple behind it. So Colin Barreth and Cleona Nihrulia are very, very authentic people. They were both brought up with the Irish language, and if you've heard any of the interviews that they've done uh, since the film was made, you'll hear this uh, ringing true. So they were very authentic to the base story that they took, Foster, by Claire Keegan. They were also very authentic in that the production was done through the medium of the Irish language because they were brought up with Irish and they felt that was really important to the whole production. They were also very authentic because this production was made during COVID. So they had to really look after all of their cast and their crew. They had to work under all the uh, restrictions that were, that were in place at the time and they, they worked their way through. And what happened was they made a modern masterpiece in Irish, which went to the Oscars. And I know we as Irish speakers were incredibly proud of them. The Irish media industry were extremely proud of them, and mostly the Irish people were very, very proud of them. But I think it's that sense of their authenticity of being true to themselves and true to what they believed in, which made them a fantastic example of real leadership. So we can see that with real leadership, you can make amazing things happen. But why I'm here tonight is to say to you, we need an awful lot more real leadership. So who are the real leaders? Well, I've got news for you. The real leaders are me and you, the people you're sitting next to, and the people you know. So have a think about what your sphere of influence is. Is it your friends, your place of work, your clubs, your social circles? How can you make a real difference? And it doesn't have to be a big global action. Rosa Parks sat down on a seat in a bus. What can you do? So I'd like to leave you with another little thought. When I was growing up as a scruffy 12-year-old in Huddersfield, and I had a Huddersfield accent, <laughs> if somebody had told me that within my lifetime I'd see a black US president speaking my native language in Dublin, I probably wouldn't have believed them. But Real leadership makes amazing things happen. And lo and behold, again, in February 2011, we had Barack Obama visit us. And do you remember the immortal words that he spoke that day? He said, Is Fader Lin. Yes, we can. And with real leadership, yes, we can. And yes, you can. So what are you going to do about it? Go to meet him, Hagi.